Coming up next, former head writer of Saturday Night Live, Jim Downey. Jim Downey. Jim Downey. James Downey. Yep. My boss, your boss, right? Uh, in a sense, yeah. He was collaborator. He, oh, he great told me he was my writer. Boss. <laughs> <laughs> he was David's boss. Yeah. David only David's contracts would be in seven to ten day increments. <laughs> seven to ten minutes. I had one. That, I had a twelve year contract. <laughs> but God, David would be. Phil got a three year one. I was shitting. They go. We're gonna give you. Th-. They give him like two Phil? years, three million bucks or something. For Phil, Phil? Phil Hartman. When when he re upped when he did the very his last year he, he did his initial five because yeah, we, and then I think, he went because he had power to to do it I think you might have gone but he stayed Good Lord. no I only I only kick because David's always self deprecating about his time on the S- yeah. SNL yeah well world. what happened was they were calling the summer and say if you got picked up again and you didn't know so I'd have to lug my fucking mattress out of my apartment get out of my apartment yeah cancel it <laughs> come to L A and stay in my other one I shared with someone and then they'd hire me back and I go fuck just tell me I'm hired so I don't have to stress the fuck out and I have to fly all the way back and get in a part it's like I wasted even more money and time so I remember that because at the party you'd say sometimes to Lauren Michaels hey I'll see you Monday at the meeting Lauren goes perhaps (laughs) and that was chilly and I'd pull Lauren aside and go Lauren come on I mean David's really funny we should just sign him up for at least two weeks I go who's the host Monday he goes "Mm, we'll see if you'll know I go, why? Because you might not need to know. Where should I sit in the Monday meeting room? Should I be up on the couch or should I just go Indian style on the floor? Um, you can decide later. Uh, Marcy, you would make room for David? I don't know if we Is have Is it Michael room. Keaton? Who told you that? I go, well, Lauren, I'm on the show. I have to write for him. Do you? <laughs> I go, well, I'm, I work here, right? Do you? <laughs> Do you? David's <laughs> going through that thing of like, am I really on the show or not? <laughs> and he just sort of hangs around the soda machine. Um, we should have him removed from the premises. Exactly. It was tough out there. So every year I'd get picked up. And I, I never got more than a one-year pickup. So it was tough. <laughs> so Jim Downey. Jim Downey, great, great. Big writer. We didn't say this. Head writer, he, he did first five years of SNL. Then he went and did the, started Letterman for five years. So two monster shows in there. And then he day. returns to SNL yeah. as the head writer when I arrived. Yeah. And uh, he was head writer for like 11 years. Then he wrote, he wrote Update with Norm MacDonald, stuff like that. He wrote. He has a great resume. He's like this big presence at SNL that maybe some of you aren't as familiar with. So this will be a little different flavor. We do all kinds. A lot of people go, just go with huge stars. I go, guess what, fans? We're going to have some real no. writers. We're going to have people down in the bowels of De- 30 Remember Rock. Dennis said he's one of the, he's the second most important person in the history of SNL. He is. There's Lauren and then there's Jim being such a big powerhouse writer and forming the type of writing we're doing. I had to go to, I had to run by stuff stuff by him all the time and it was very hard to get his attention because the head writer is pulled in every direction so everyone is trying to get a hold of the head writer to punch up their thing yeah, yeah. And he did all those letterman bits at the beginning he, so he's he's great and uh he's kind of a recluse and he didn't know how to do zoom so uh it's great we uh, got him on to talk he never zoomed never been on a podcast never listened to a podcast yeah that's <laughs> true right so he broke the seal on three things in in our little episode time with jim yeah anyway so i got another joke should i waste it here okay yeah, oh no dan will get mad at this one this is just a joke okay okay so here's how you could here's if a girl's having an orgasm <laughs> if they if they're having a medium one they say heather back me up on this they say oh my oh my oh my and if they're having a really good one they go, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And if they're not having one, they go, oh, Dana, oh, Dana. I pulled you into it. Yeah. I'm the guy. Why? Well, I, I heard this from reliable sources that when David is getting with a woman Frisky. and he has an orgasm, he screams his own name. God damn it. David. Who told you that? That's why I do it in this room. It's soundproof. <laughs> It's funny. You just when you hear these things, you go, "Well, how many orgasm verbal jokes do I have in my I head?" Know. That's the only one I remember. That's the only. I just heard it because someone did it to me, so I had to do it to you. Even though you're a happily married man, I just said, "This is funny." I'll do. I'll use Dana. I was first. I laughed, 
Then I was kind of delighted. Then I was offended. This is all within mm. three tenths of a second. Then I thought, I'll come back with my David yeah. Screams' own name. Yeah, and now we're even. Well, well what are we talking even about? Even Steven. I hate to be named Steven. Even Steven. Oh, that would be the worst. <laughs> God, what a fucking nightmare name to have. Now we got Downey. So, Downey, sorry we went off track there, but that was a fucking real winner. Jim Downey, a very interesting person. You could give him any subject in the world and leave the room. He literally goes to libraries at Yale, goes in and just reads. You what know? a nerd. <laughs> what a nerd. What a, ne what a genius nerd. Hey, what are you reading, nerd? <laughs> I'm reading Agricultural Manifestation, Early Colonial Times. That sounds nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> Half the people there are Harvard and Yale and yeah, Cambridge. We were kind of, I was, They're I, all I, a bunch of nerds. I wanted to ask him if he thought I was stupid when I joined because I went to Scottsdale Community College, but I think he never answered the question, so I think that's a yes. You didn't know what Manifest Destiny was, and I remember they just, I the writers what, would get in a room, they'd laugh for hours. Hubert Spade didn't know what <laughs> Manifest Destiny was. <laughs> oh, I know. I'd walk around with a thesaurus, mostly for Dennis. <laughs> All right, so Dan, Jim Downey is going to talk, and you're going to listen. So do it. Dana, we're going to put a pin in that story. <laughs> D Downey, my boss. Robert Downey Jr.'s uncle? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's just say so. Is that real? Let's, that's, we've agreed. Everyone, all parties have agreed that's the official line. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm related to Philip Carvey from, from uh, East Toronto, but there's no what? pizzazz to that. No. There's only five Carvies in North America. You've never met another Carvey, I, have I you? I absolutely have never met another Carvey. But are, only weren't five. You, weren't you born in Montana? Yes. Okay. See, I That's remember, I remember things. I know, because no. people Spade, think I'm Canadian. David what Spade out of, out of the Phoenix area, I know. AZ. Scottsdale, yeah. easy, yeah. Okay. She's yeah. what a memory. <laughs> you know, uh, Dan Dana, Jim, uh, when I got hired, Jim is was my, the head writer of SNL. He's got a million credits we'll get to. But just quickly, when I got hired mm -hmm. with Schneider, we I think, Jim, you walked us through, you know. Uh, you had to walk us and say, here's your legal pad. Here's a wooden desk um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that Number I thought pencil. jokes would come from. But I had to come up with them. And you go... And then you sit at this desk and stare at that white wall, and you sit at that one, and um, we're going to uh, go from there. So, uh, and that and was every, it. Everything I told you was true. <laughs> oh, that was true. There was a no desk. more than the truth. <laughs> yeah, no one went like overboard with with uh, what to do there. Well, Jim Jim came over to my office after that and said, "I told him, I told him good, like you said." <laughs> anyway, that's that's inside baseball. But uh, Jim and I had a kind of an inside joke about newcomers. Totally kidding. It was part of the hazing. We all had to go through it, except me, because I, you know, was started in there. So, you were yes. the original hazer at Harvard. Yeah. Did you ever get pink bellied at Harvard? Um, pink bellied? No. We you know, most of the brutal stuff, the the caning and the paddling, had been phased <laughs> out. But uh, <laughs> I always thought it was an insane practice of just this psychosocial homoerotic hazing that would happen in men's dorms. I just yeah. thought, no, no, thank you. Kissing the Gunner's Daughter, it was called. Oh. Really? Oh, God, I didn't want to know. That, and that was a blowjob. That job. sounds more illicit than anything you've ever said in real life. Yeah, it's not, none of that's true. I was at the ASU. I was at ASU, Jim, which is a college. It's not Harvard. Well, I don't you know had you Frank Cush running your I had hazing. Frank Cush knocking people around, <laughs> and uh, I was getting hazed with, uh, they spray painted a number on you, and that's you right. had to run around at four in the morning and, and uh, bring everyone a river rock and then do shots. And then they put oil and uh, paprika on me. And when they pushed this button, they sprayed on you. You had to say something they tell you to say. Um, I was a little bit of a follower at the time. I feel I wasn't really a leader uh, and I did it. And then I finally had to quit because uh, I go, this isn't getting me as much as I thought it would out of life. <laughs> it all, wait, all went I, up hell. I, I just, yeah. I, a river rock. Is that, what is that? Well, when you're, 
This is great. You're listening to the whole story and you pick something you like out of it. River rocks are, there's rivers uh, in Arizona that are by Arizona State and they don't ever have any water in them. So it's mostly rocks. And at the bottom, there's little smooth rocks from the uh, flooding and rivers and what we have. So you just have to climb down the river, grab them, and then carry them in a bucket. They're super heavy. And the idea is it's a fucking drag. I think that's the idea. See, I thought here, I thought River Rock had to be code for something filthy or illicit. Or yeah. for cocaine. That's the, way yeah. that's the way your mind thinks. That's the yeah, end, sadly. <laughs> I'm sorry. The creative mind. Now I feel I owe I owe the entire state of Arizona an apology for that, and especially Arizona State University <laughs> and the Sun Devils. Yeah, I love Our Arizona State. Yeah. Should we should we go a little bit? Like I don't know how much we can't cover the life of Jim Downey, but no. we can say he was a very very young man out of Harvard and was hired to write on Saturday Night Live with the original cast. That's right. Yeah, that's fair, right? That's the known more than the truth. Bill Murray and I were hired the same week, so we um, were put in an office together and. Uh, stayed there for Jesus. Uh, yeah. How what, cool. What would your thoughts? Do you remember like, okay, to me, Bill Murray was always so intimidating. I really like him, but he just kind of scared me. Was he, was he always like an intimidating figure because of his confidence or something? Right. And would he know you if he saw you today? Would he remember? I'm sure that he would know me. I'm sure. Okay. Oh, no, they're I'm very kidding. good friends. I know. They're very, very. <laughs> I just want to bust his balls. He actually, I, I know what you're saying. In terms of comedy, he is, he's not, uh, you know, he can be a little intimidating. You know, there's some people who instantly, they want to sort of join in. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's sort of the in, invitations always there to, hey, let's, let's, you know, goof around. Mm -hmm. And Billy mm -hmm. is, is not. He's more like in life, he's a super friendly person. You know, mm -hmm. he's a guy who yeah. you walk down the street with him and 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 he'll talk to everyone except like celebrity, you know, paparazzi or stalkers. He's some, he has a really good sense of when someone's just a real person and someone's <laughs> a pro, you know? Yeah. I mean, I had a front row seat on the 40th anniversary. I was waiting to do Chop Broccoli at the piano. It was at Medley, and I'm just sitting there. And then Bill comes out, and he does a song on this, and it practically stole the show. His commitment was so extreme. I told him afterwards, it really was making me laugh. Well, you know, there's a story behind that is the oldest piece I've ever been involved with from, from conception to actual production. That goes mm -hmm. back to the fall, to like to like 1977, that wow. Billy Billy would sing a fragment. He would sing the fragment like, Jaws, get away from me, Jaws, <laughs> that thing. And yeah. then I was always <laughs> obsessed with, with getting that on the show. And so when the 40th anniversary thing came up, I I, I said, look, I want to complete the that song, I want to write the, you know, make it a song. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I came up with the part about, you know, um, the, the um, and now Jaws, you found someone new. Tell me, Jaws, oh. you know, uh, what am I supposed I, to do? No, am I not enough for you? you know? <laughs> and then so we, we added that and Paul Schaefer came up with the tagline, you bastard Jaws, as the final thing. And then we um, and so I was so obsessed with getting that on. I'd never like push something harder. And Billy was sort of, OK, whatever, if you think, because it had never we'd never done anything with it ever oh, in funny. all those years. But every few years I would I would bring it up and say, God, that's that should be that should appear somewhere. And then. When the time came to do the anniversary, I had already sort of um, I was singing the song and pitching it to uh, Maya Rudolph. And um, I guess I guess Amy Poehler was in on it. Probably. And, um, yeah. Uh, and and um, Emily Spivey, who was a great mm -hmm. writer, who who of a younger generation who who worked on that that whole sequence. And then mm -hmm. but Billy was doing the Pebble Beach pro-am golf tournament and he he would not that thing ended well that's the that's night right. before so he would not hear of leaving early he not only had oh, to I remember stay that. for his part yeah. but he he absolutely refused 
to duck out of it before it was officially over. So I think our thing was a Sunday night, right? It mm-hmm. had to be, right? Yeah. That's when they no, do those. Very minimal so, rehearsal. So yeah. the, the tournament ended like some kind of ceremony Saturday evening. Mm-hmm. And so that was the earliest he would consider leaving. So we had to get a private jet for him and everything, but he he made it. He slept. He arrived in the hotel which like I Sunday, paid for. which David Spade paid for. I was really <laughs> knocked out. And then and then Billy like slept for an hour in his hotel mm-hmm. room. And then we got him to NBC, did the one and only rehearsal with Paul Schaefer up, believe it or not, in our old office upstairs. How it just fun. happened to be. And then uh, with Emily Spivey was there. And then um, mm-hmm. and then we went down. And then, by the way, I happened to wander through and check cue cards because uh, I just, you know, by by habit. And someone had changed. had taken out you bastard. Oh, and and yes, and not not because it's dirty, but because it, it's offensive to people whose parents didn't bother to get married or something. Jesus. So, really? So and okay. I was like, no one had run that by me. And they also wouldn't let him say, got you goddamn jaws, because what? that supposedly is offensive to believing Christians. And so, yeah, I just said, you know what? I will take this on myself. It'll be my responsibility. So I just changed it back. And said, if they have a problem with it, they can sue me. No one's going to complain. You will no not get one. one call. And they did not get any calls. Who has the balls to paint over that Picasso? It's you and Bill Murray writing something, and you're like, let me take a swing at well, this. Well, this is. Um, let me punch and it. I, up. Ma- I ran into Emily after <laughs> the fact, and I said, Emily, what the what the hell was that? Where they? She said, Oh yeah, they just told me we couldn't do that. And I said, No, 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 you don't. I mean, no, 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 no. Yeah, they don't. Us. You know, it's afterwards. Then they kind of seemed to let it go because when I was doing the Italian waiter sketch with Victoria Jackson, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, and I, I, it, I, put her, I put her on a table, and right. you know, Vicky's so funny and light. <laughs> her, oh, she is the most her, game person ever. And was so that she is for this, and then yeah, oh, yeah, and then she puts her legs over, and I'm just talking and kind of moving, <laughs> and that was the dress show. It killed. And then the air show kind of pretending to get me to, get to me was either Schneider or Steve Korn or Robert Smigel kind of going, Hey, don't, I didn't remember if they, I kind of chose to ignore them. Yeah. And then I did it anyway, but you then, chose, then we, choosing nev- we to never kill. heard a word. Yeah. That's your book. So. Choose to kill. Yeah. You're never, it's always going to be on the performer. I know that that kind of note was just there for like legal reasons or the equivalent to say, and we told him, I gave him the note, but the, in fact, Something that funny, they're, they're not going to complain about it. Of course, about, people that watch like the idiots. show want that. You know, Jim, one time I think you were there. You were there my whole run, I'm pretty sure. You're but, probably, yeah. But by I the was, way, just as an insert, you were the head writer for 11 years? Well, 86 to 97? And, that, and yeah, then let's get back to David's story. Technically, 30 years. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. well, 85. Uh, I hate to say that was not a, one of our better seasons, but 85 until through 95, yeah. Okay, so David, what was your? I, I was there, so I was saying in that in that train of thought when I did an update with Dennis, and he says uh, I, I was doing an in and out list, what's in and what's out, yeah, and, yeah, I, yeah. and one of them was uh, uh, not enunciating so you can get stuff on the air and <laughs> going out and get some pussy, and uh, and then Andrew Brewer comes back. He, I see him in the hallway. He goes, no. No. And I go, it did good. And he goes, and I didn't say it, it didn't do good. good. And he goes, you have to fix it. And he goes, if you, we're in the hallway behind the quick change by the page desk. And he goes, I go, come on, don't take this away. I got nothing. He goes, you can say hussy, but you can't say hussy. And so, I go, God damn it. So I go out there and, and, and then I go, uh, I'm, I'm scared because it's coming up in the bit. It's making me so nervous. And I go, go out after the show and get some hussy. And it killed. And Dennis goes, you're dead, dude. <laughs> <laughs> right when it went to commercial, goes you're fired because it killed too hard, and then yeah, he's like, right. "They can't." Yeah. Um, it is it's over. It's a it's, it's a a matter of will, and then you know you will to victory, and then when you have victory, they can't touch you. They can't, yeah. If it um, bombs, then there's a bigger problem. If it bombs, but fortunately, we're not talking about that here. We but like I say, bombing. yeah. <laughs> but I never now, heard I never heard boo about the supposed um. 
Jim, did we have a the first censorship guy? Was he like Mr. Clockworthy? Did I imagine that with a bow the tie? Very, no, the very first guy who was <laughs> great was a guy named Jay Otley, who was okay. had been literally a former male model, and he was like super. He looked like those guys in the '60s, like cigarette ads. Mm-hmm. He was just he's an extremely handsome yeah. man, very distinguished, <laughs> middle aged guy, and. Nothing bothered him at all. Already. <laughs> he was a censorship Never. guy. For- he was just kind of. It didn't seem he, like you had one that first couple kind, years. I mean, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember being told there was anything that we couldn't do. Awesome. Um, and Jay Otley was. Oh, he was magnificent. I mean, everything would. He would just kind of. No, that's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> really? What no, was he great, there yeah. when I was there? He's reporting was, to no, no one. He really. wasn't. He wasn't. He was the first. He was. Uh, he was like a super. He was an out out gay man. He was just incredibly, right. uh, just a, a super cool guy. He's like just, uh, you know, he he, you know, he, like at least I, he struck me. He's like a Fred Astaire type, you know, just super elegant, <laughs> but had seen wow. everything. Nothing bothered him. It, it and then he was replaced by Bill Clotworthy. I that remember was that name. Number. I had. I remember that name. And Bill and he actually, had a little bow tie, and he was very stern. Bill was sweet. a little, a little, you know, the we had rougher sledding with with Mr. Clotworthy, but he was a decent guy. I mean, you could you could uh, he would hear your arguments. And then, um, well, I, Roz Wyman, she was head of standards. I remember oh, having. I remember her. Yeah. And and I remember, Dana, you remember this piece that I, I wrote with uh, with Tom and Tom Davis. It was the Pussy Whip talk show. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it was. And, and he it wouldn't let sound. us. Yeah, we yeah. wouldn't. He wouldn't let us say. It was supposed to be pussy whipped. We had to end up with pee whipped. And P-whipped, again, whipped, I remember. And again, okay. it was not because of the word pussy, like they right. gave it to, you know. To yeah. yeah. Pussy was thing. fine. It was the concept of pussy whipped was offensive. And I remember Roz Wyman saying to me, as a woman, I find this entirely offensive. And that's when I figured out just like oh. bastard wasn't about bastard being a dirty word. It was by that time, it was a, a PC thing, you know, uh, by the time right. we we're talking about yeah. the, 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 the 40th, 40th anniversary. But as far as, as far as pussy whipped, it was, it was an, it was, uh, you know, insulting to women, womankind, which I didn't really, I think all women, understand the concept of being yeah. pussy whip. I don't, <laughs> totally. I don't think that was, <laughs> well, you know, he, I mean, Clock, <laughs> clockworthy wouldn't let me say when I first did church lady, she had a couple penises in there. You're a penis that kind yeah, of like I sexually, mean, he said, no. So I, I put in more stuff. I cut penis sure, and I put weird, in weird. throbbing, engorged, bulbous, bulbous, <laughs> low. And, and he got, and Clockworth is like, well, this is terrific. Throbbing meat <laughs> muscle. Throbbing <laughs> Satan stick, bulbous, and yeah. engorged. He goes, I love this. Just don't say really? penis. Really? Wow. Well, it's even it dirtier through. in a, we- in a weird dirtier, way. Much dirtier. Yeah. Much yes. more pornographic. But- but I also I also <laughs> thought you were you were you were going for the oldest trick of the book, which even the NBC <laughs> standards department figured out after a while, which was you <laughs> load it up with cannon fodder that you're that you can trade away. Oh, you get right. rid of stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, you, I did you, do that. You, you write stuff that you you don't even want, but but it's it's there <laughs> just so you have barter. something to. to yeah. yeah. And then it's you, like you kind of act like it's you like go, Come sailors. On. It's like sailors bringing trinkets to trade with the natives, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, you'll get this slinky for this eighteen acres of land. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's well, like politicians? <laughs> the bill's going to cost seven hundred trillion. Yes. And then you go, well, could it be twenty trillion? Well, okay. Look All what right, I gave up. Busting yeah. my balls, but yeah. yeah well, which president was that, Dana? That's the only president that wasn't an opinion. I was a, actually a trying to do. I only do Bernie Sanders as a crosswalk. Guard. Okay. Don't proceed. Don't proceed. The system is rigged. Don't proceed. No. But I was trying to think of Bernie like that. It's six trillion dollars. I'll give you three trillion back. What the fuck is going on? I love the way. <laughs> anyway. Uh, um, oh, wait. By the way, when you worked with Billy Murray, you didn't have to pee in a bottle in your dressing room like some people at the show, did you? 
Um, I don't recall doing that just for fun, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> One of our cast members did during my years. In a bottle? Yeah. And just oh, left a bunch of bottles in his room. Oh, it must have been Mr. Christopher Farley. No, it actually wasn't Farley. Oh, it wasn't Farley? No. I'm, Wait he a was, minute. He would only shit out the window no, for fun. He, he, <laughs> he, did, he did wipe his butt with a USA Today once when we were, uh, I guess it was right before read through. <laughs> we love Chris. He's the greatest. He, and he doesn't even take his pants off. You know, Downey, he uh he was um I know you loved him. He um he had he would when he found Belushi's pants and wardrobe, you know, they they the wardrobe was so ex- extensive there and they would give him pants and for his size they would dig back and he would just look in and it would see in their written belushi and he'd oh, that's go, right. yeah, oh my god these are fucking belushis and then he'd put them on and then even if they gave him different pants he would put them under his pants no kidding because it wow. was like good luck he, yeah he was so obsessed yeah he loved belushi Jim. Oh Obsessed man, the, with him. the yeah. experience of giving John Belushi notes was always <laughs> okay. Now I'm yeah, on let's get to Tell that. us. Okay. There we go. That's, that's what would, we want to um, hear. We would go in in like a team, you know, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Frank, to trick him. Frank and you know Frank is famously Blunt. impervious he, to yeah, to yeah. manners Anything. and sensitivity and everything. Mm-hmm. And so he he was always good, like shock troops, you know. To like, yeah. he was the bombing that, yeah. that, 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 the happened, ground. that happened <laughs> yeah. before we le- came Soften in with the, the troop, battle the troop carriers. Yeah. And so and then I was usually the first wave in, you know, dancing through the minefields. And he'd be in Belushi, be sitting there staring, you know, sort of sullenly in his dressing room. And I'd go like and then knock, you know, hey, John, um, hey, yeah, on this thing. Uh, you know, I mean, it's great. It's great with you in it with, and he'd instantly start, um, uh, in that. And it was, it was experience. I had, I had a, um, a friend of mine who, who visited the show one time and Belushi and Danny had done the blues brothers as a warm up, which that's how it began. They warmed up, you know, the audiences and then, great. and then, then they just, you know, decided we're going to do this big time. And anyway, he was, and that was and at that time, that was all the Belushi really cared about. It seemed. <laughs> um, and, and so he, he was what he, he lived for nothing more than compliments about the blues brothers. And so <laughs> my friend, my friend who was, who was, he was incapable of not being completely honest, however insane it was in a situation. So, we were, he was sitting with me at the party. He was a friend from high school. And, um, and, 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 and I said, Hey, John, uh, the blues brothers. Awesome. That was awesome. Once he goes, Hey, thanks, man. And my friend just goes, you need to time your heart. Uh, you need to time your singing better with Ackroyd's, uh, harmonica. Oh boy. The and plus Lucy one. Goes, and Lucy's literally goes, what did you say? Uh, says, I said, grrr. I said, you need to time you're singing better with <laughs> as though he hadn't heard it, you know, <laughs> with, with Ackroyd's heart playing. And so he goes, there was nothing wrong with the timing of my singing with, with Ackroyd. Oh yeah, there was. Yeah, there was. <laughs> so wow. It, it went Who on are you there. bringing? Yeah. That's ballsy for, <laughs> no, he for just anybody. didn't understand. He was like, he, he was, was unsocialized. He was like musically. What, if you want to get it perfect, he's like, it's working. <laughs> I, I wouldn't worry about it. His By the way, one of us is idea. tapping the desk. Dane, is I'm that sorry, you? That was me. That was oh, okay. me. Okay. We'll keep sorry. an eye on that. It's all right. We can I start over. I would have just said to him, Lou, I love everything <laughs> about that bit. The whole singing the blues part, I'm not at key. T- take it away from the blues. Don't sing, Yeah. but just talk about Sorry, go ahead. But, but one of the reasons um, Belushi and I, got, I got along much, be- probably better with Belushi than any of the other writers because- he was from Wheaton, Illinois, and I had cousins who Belushi <laughs> knew who lived in Wheaton, and that was essentially it. So it was like I was like his cuz. So he would he would talk to me. And of course, you know, all of the writers got on great with Dan Aykroyd. So but he Sweet he was heart. not nice to the women at the show, I have to say. And um, Dan, Danny or Jim or Danny? John Belushi. John Danny John? was great with everybody. Yeah. Danny's a sweetheart. But what what would would 
uh, Belushi ever like throw furniture or anything? Like, because he was so powerful on screen, you know, he was such a potent character. Did he ever do stuff backstage? I mean, you just think of him as a badass pirate, and barely under control. But I never yeah, met him. There was always this menace below the surface, but I never saw him. I never saw he, both Danny and and Billy. You know, were more. I, I saw you know get more physical. But John, I don't ever remember. He just, but he would have mm-hmm. this way of sort of glowering. And, um, but like I say, you know, he, yeah. when he, there's certain moments that were so Belushi that uh, him, did you guys see, ever see the, um, him doing Mussolini at the, uh, it was the show we did from New Orleans where very little in that show actually worked, but all <laughs> the Belushi stuff did. He he was doing, we had a, one of those balconies, you know, there's in the French mm-hmm. quarter. Yeah. That would make sense. Lorraine yeah. said, Lorraine Newman said it was a shit show down there. It was crazy. It was, it was fun to do it. And it was, you know, we, I ate a lot of great restaurants and, and it was fun. I'd never been to New Orleans before, but the show itself was we couldn't communicate with each other. We were doing it at different locations all over the city. But Belushi did this this uh, Mussolini thing where it was just pure Belushi and it was brilliant. And with a, with like a real like crowd below and he just had all the moves down. And he also yeah. did uh, uh, Michael O'Donoghue wrote this this thing, um, the uh, winner of the hit, hit Al Hurt in the mouth of the brick contest. And I don't, I don't know if you <laughs> the guys trumpet are, player, <laughs> the trumpet player, Al Hurt. See, this is something you've got to be at minimum my age to know the actual reference. But Al Hurt was famous New Orleans trumpet player. And once one time somebody threw a brick at him. And hit him at, so it's just Belushi playing trumpet, like very nervously. Like watching for the bricks coming. I can't yeah, explain it. I love it. I invite you well, guys he to would check commit it out. So, so it hard. was in that show. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Belushi would just commit like crazy. Was he doing drugs you know? during shows or you just catch it? Was no, it more of an no. after? No, no. He, after I don't, party I don't remember, situation. I don't remember that ever interfering with it. It was more when John was difficult. It was more. Um, it was more just attitudinal things that you know, I mean, he did sort of. He did when he got into music, he I think he the show ceased to be his absolute top priority. You yeah, know? I remember because sometimes drugs make people moody in quotes. And sometimes with Farley, <laughs> I go, bit. I think you're being moody right now. <laughs> and I wish we could find where that's coming from. Uh, I wish we could trace it back to something. Uh, but I remember that uh, I, I could imagine that John, by the way, I don't care if John did drugs during the show. I mean, the shows are funny and they stand up as like, you yeah. know, my, my whole childhood is based <laughs> on it. It's the fucking greatest. So, I don't give a shit, but if people can do their job, I think drunk is harder to deal with when people are, uh, you deal with people well, that drunk, try to perform. Drunk can, can makes you slurrier and yeah. slower on, on. You're not nailing shit. Yeah, yeah, I did Robert Downey Jr. Not, wait a minute. Who was the guy who was the incendiary talk show in so New Jersey? Morton Downey. Downey. Morton Downey. Morton Downey. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Morton Downey Jr. was now coming he, on he church He is chat. in no way related. Okay, go on. No way related, and I think he's gone to the stars, but he was really in the tank. I mean, it was... Oh, that's right. I forgot he was so that he nervous. was on the show. Yeah, oh, he came, came on. on church chat. Yeah, he was like a Jerry Springer for the audience. He was like one of yeah, the first, yeah. like really incendiary fucking hosts yeah. that got everyone but, riled but up. Drunk and sketch comedy—that's tough. I mean, that's. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not terrifying. saying there. Yeah, I, well, you guys are, are, would know better than I, but I would think that it would be impossible if you're alone in front of an audience to be drunk. You'd have to have a very weird kind of act to me. No, I've definitely, I, I've had a few uh, cordials before I go on stage sometime. Really? Jim, it's just the pressures of life. I and know, um, I mean, So you get it. So I, I go saw, on there. I saw the documentary. Have a few on. <laughs> on me? <laughs> <laughs> you have a it's lot of heartache to swallow. The Dark Side of Babai. Did you see that? <laughs> That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> so I'd have a few uh, knocks, as my dad would say, and then. Uh, but sometimes you're off your game a little bit. You're right. There's a, there's a fine line between hey, I'm feeling good, and then like, fuck, what joke is next? I don't even remember. I'm in the middle of a joke, I don't know what's going on. So, but I have, have a question a half, for you, Jim. But Not, like- but we all love uh, Norm and uh, this OJ situation on Update. That people have asked me, 
was was Norm leaving? Was it a direct result? Because you were, I think, you were writing for Update with him, right? He was yeah, kind of the producer yeah. and was, co-writer with Norm. Yeah, you guys yeah. were like locked in a room doing it. That that was all yeah. you guys. Yeah, Norm on Update was my one of my successful projects at the show. It was one that I it, it was entirely my. He was my candidate um, in a very crowded field because the network had determined that Kevin, they were not going to give Kevin another chance. I personally oh, thought Kevin, yeah, Kevin Nealon had been doing update from the time Dennis left. And, um, uh, I personally, uh, you know, Neil Nisi Bonham about, you know, the dead, but, uh, um, the herb Sergeant was not doing Kevin any favors the way he was running update. And, huh. and it was hard to sort of, sort of to get, to get help to Kevin because, you know, it had to go through her, had to go through mm -hmm. Herb and Herb was sort of like ran interference and wouldn't know oh, to yeah. get through and everything. So he didn't I, love my update pieces either. I, and so I, I um, felt like the second week I met Norm, that he would be a perfect guy if Kevin, you know, left the show or anything. That, and so when, when the network announced, you know, it was all my go, no, nope, no, no, Neilan's out. He's dead. He's gone. Forget about it. Not happening. <laughs> so that started this thing where there were several different candidates, but Norm was my guy. And it sort of he wasn't initially the favorite, but he sort of survived. And and um, so as far as the OJ stuff is 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 concerned, um, that if you remember, the murders by persons as yet huh. unknown happened in June of 1994, which mm. is when we were having this meeting out in L.A., which, by the way, ended. It was I was summoned out for the first time to have a, a notes meeting with uh, as you know, head writer slash producer of the show. And um, Lauren and I were out there at the NBC headquarters and it was. Don Allmeyer and uh, Rick Ludwin and uh, Warren Littlefield. I think Bernie Brillstein was in the meeting. I'm pretty sure. Oh, and um, so manager. they were and Allmeyer. They were very unhappy with the show because the ratings had dropped. And I thought it was we were on like a sugar high the year before that in 92, 93 from the Wayne's World movie, you know, that that so and we had the bound political, to come down. political yeah, campaign. we had the debates and yeah. stuff and yeah. so the ratings dropped i'll i'll be i'll be it to a rating number that they would they would die for Kill today for yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but but anyway so they were taking they were giving us their notes on what they didn't like and everything and um i had gone there um my marriage was falling apart because of the, the, the time at the show and stuff and so i kind of I would I was sort of feeling like I don't know if I want to keep doing this. So my attitude was I'm not going to do anything to save my job. I'm not going to beg or plead or agree <laughs> to any take, you know, I'm going to just tell them what I think. And and if they don't like it, it'll it's just as six and one to me if I get fired or not. And in the end, that sort of backfired because I heard later <laughs> like Olmeyer was impressed by your moxie. He did, which is not, <laughs> not the intention. But anyway, so they were talking about update and they just said, and Kevin had to go. I would never have put, I would never, I love Kevin. I still love him. He's he unreal. was one of our, he's, he's he was a great favorite with the writers. Yeah. And you I could just, have helped I thought, Kevin. I, I could have. I thought if, if they had been willing to keep Kevin, but get rid of Herb, I think that we could have turned that thing around. But, um, but anyway, that was not the, that was not the option available. So, Anyway, but the meeting, the meeting ended only because visiting hours were starting at L.A. County and and Olmeyer had to go visit O.J. Wow. That's why that meeting ended wow. finally, mercifully. And so then when the fall came, uh, there's a whole other story with how Norm came to be the guy. But but Norm is doing update. And I told him at the beginning, I said, look, I don't mean anything, not nothing about her, but attempts have been made in the past to, to to help people doing update and that her blocked all efforts to because he got you know was threatened and territorial and everything and so i told norm like look we're not we're not going to fuck around we're not going to let her do to you what he did to kevin and and so you can have your herb meeting but you got to have a later one with me because we're not i'm not, I'm not fucking around this time it's too important 
and and mm-hmm. and you know say yeah yeah that sounds great you know so so <laughs> what would happen is we first of all opened the piece up for the first time to lots and lots of writers so you suddenly got a lot more writers contributing yeah. and and then we would just overrule decisions that herb made until and herb never i never even had a conversation with herb about it and we just and so but the basically so to answer your original question um the way norm came to be fired was we just did the oj jokes because they were funny it wasn't none yeah. of us had I a hard right. on for oj or anything but but it was he was in the news every fun. fucking day too like there's I you know. can't you can't avoid it yeah and so luckily the timing couldn't have been better you know the trial opened just before we went on the air <laughs> we uh um and then the very next year the fall of 95 the are the openings the f- week of the first show the verdict came back hmm. and so but anyway um he just the, the, every week I would hear occasionally from Lauren and I knew it was Olmeyer calling him to complain, but it was <laughs> Lauren would go like, how, how is it that you and Norm seem to be the only people absolutely convinced of OJ's guilt? Uh, and I would go like, Lauren, Lauren, come on, come on. Goes, well, I, I think it's I think it's hurting us with black audience. And I said, first of all, we the have no black audience. The was very small. <laughs> we and have second, no and oh, second, second um, I think I think it could only help us because the you know black people know that that OJ did it. Come on, and so and so anyway. Finally, um, we did the first season of Update, which was ninety four, ninety five. Uh, that was the trial. The second mm-hmm. season, uh, 95, 96 of Norm's Update. That was the aftermath of the trial and the civil trial, right? And then we threw in we threw in the 96, 97, the third season just for for shits and grins. You know, we continued to do so we did, I'm sure we did an OJ joke, at least one OJ joke every, oh, yeah. every show, yeah. For for from 94, 95, and 96. And then finally, the fall of 97. You know, that was Norm's fourth season and the season we were fired. Fall 97. <laughs> Package deal. Yes, we, there was nothing to do. There was nothing to do about OJ. It would have felt like. You feel was it's overkill. Something. Well, no, no. That part no, that's we Lauren. liked. That, no, we liked the overkill. We always said. Of course. In fact, I, I heard this quote much later, but I wish I'd known it. Joseph Stalin. You know, Norm, someone I comedy people don't normally quote. But yeah. Joseph Stalin said. Quantity has a quality all its own. (laughs) (laughs) That was like the David Hasselhoff jokes too. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, we love, and let me just finish. So so the, so we opened that season, the fall 97, right? Spring 98. We didn't do any OJ jokes. We didn't do any OJ jokes for the first eight shows. And then the Christmas, it was a strong stretch of like, it was like the bombardment has stopped. And then suddenly I think they stopped. They have stopped, you know, it's it's peace in, in the valley. And then on the eighth show, we did two OJ jokes because there was the one thing about the Trell Sprewell. Remember, he was playing for the Knicks and he went nuts in a practice. He choked the coach. He choked coach, PJ yeah. Carl, Carlissimo. Oh, choked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we did a joke about Johnny and he hired Johnny Cochran as his attorney. And mm-hmm. so. We did a joke about it. Cochran has vowed to find the real choker. And then <laughs> then there was OJ. If you remember this one, OJ was in a restaurant in Brentwood and his presence was bothering some of the other patrons. So the the manager of the restaurant said, oh, Mr. Simpson, um, some of our, our customers um, have, have um, their concern. And, and we were wondering if you would if you wouldn't mind um, leaving. And so OJ sued the restaurant. <laughs> but got something like 300 bucks, like a free dinner or something. So, so we did, our joke was in addition, the restaurant must now set up a uh, individual or separate murderer and non-murderer sections. <laughs> I know. And so, so OJ, so anyway, I'm, I'm at, so we did that. That was the Saturday show. Oh, a couple of days later, I'm, I'm in new Canaan visiting my little son. And the first thing I see is, the sound was off on the TV and he's sitting in his high chair and he was like, you know, two years old, I guess. And so mm-hmm. he looks up at the thing and there's, there's Chris Farley 
But with the sound off, he didn't know exactly what it was. He starts laughing hysterically just at the sight of Chris Farley. And then the <laughs> phone rings and it's Mike Shoemaker from the show, who was a producer at the show. And he says a couple of things. Uh, Chris Farley's dead and you and Norm uh, were fired. Wow. And so, yeah. And so apparently, wow. and the later, not, and guess, guess what? It was like three years later, Norm told me, and he had never said this to me, because if it were our positions were reversed, I would have said it right away. He said, you know, they, um, they told me like, it wasn't, you know, that they were only firing you, that I was welcome to stay. And I said, I won't, I won't do it without Downey. And so they said, OK, motherfucker, you know, be our guest. So that's how Norm came to be fired. He he went out of solidarity with me. So well, I think it's probably smart because you made it. You guys together were really good. It probably would have. He would have been. He would have been. He's fine great. Me, but, you but, know, um, you're great. Did right. Norm I mean, ever bring a, a joke to you or a, an idea that you that even you thought maybe went too far because he. He did he Norm? really Norm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there's actually because well, oh, he, he really would push the envelope. You know, there so. was what see with Norm, even with me, like I'd occasionally and you guys knew. Yeah, knew I, when, know. When Norm, I know. You tell me in Hollywood minute. You'd say, I dare you to do that. And I'm like, I can't. I don't want to. I got scared. But you're like, you're such oh, a pussy. And I'm he like, would God love damn. that Hollywood. But, but when, when, when you were dealing with Norm, he would he would occasionally like he would be in his Canadian geezer mode and you couldn't get him out of it. He would just have to ride it out. You just have to go, okay, he's going to be doing like, huh? I, I'm sorry. I don't quite, oh, that right. I hear well, you, yeah. but I, <laughs> I don't understand you, you know, and yeah, that kind of thing. Normal. And so he would, and so you have to go, okay, Norm, when you're ready to talk as Norm McDonald, I'm, I'm, I'm here, you know? And but anyway, so sometimes he would come in, with things where he was clearly joking and I would never take the bait. But one time <laughs> he had this joke, which there's not a lot of jokes that offend me. You know, they certainly don't offend me in the conventional mm -hmm. ways, but they often offend me. It's just, I think they're just terrible jokes, but mm -hmm. this one kind of did in a way in that sense, <laughs> but he had this joke where it was uh, well, Woody Allen is dating again. And it was the image of the, naked Vietnamese girl running down the road after the oh, napalm attack. That old photo, that old, yeah, that, stuff, old that yeah. famous old photo. And so my only reaction to that was like, Norm, come on. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> why, you can't. He goes, no, no, it's, come on. It's funny. Come on, it's, it's funny. funny. Go, Norm, Norm, <laughs> no, it's no, no. And to this day, I don't know. And, and I go, Norm, please. We no. if you do that joke in front of an audience, A, you're going to take down the rest of the, the show. The next three shows <laughs> will be <laughs> Rockefeller Center. You, know, you cannot dismantle. do that. Ah. You can't. I mean, it'll take the, the temperature in the, in the studio down 30 degrees. There'll be like ice on people's, you know, beards and stuff. You can't do that. Right. No, no, come on. It's funny. So they, he and Frank and Frank was backing him on it. Frank Sebastiano, Sebastiano one of the right. best okay. update writer ever. And he, um, Oh, he loves uh, it. And so, and so, and Frank was not, I couldn't, I would look over at Frank and Frank was not, he wasn't like winking or anything. And so I go, okay. So we tried it at dress and it had precisely the effect. I thought it would, although who knows about future shows, but anyway, <laughs> it was like this, like <gasps> this collective giant gasp. And then, uh, so after that, Norm was willing to give it up and then we didn't do it on air, obviously, but like years later. So that was like, I'm going to say that was maybe 1996. So mm -hmm. at least 10 years later, Steve Higgins, you know, who's current producer of the show, comes up to me and says, do you ever remember? And we're looking for a sound effect of an audience being like horrified, offended. <laughs> and I got, I got it. I got it. So I said, like, I directed them to that update. And I said, just I'm pretty sure. If you take that thing, the other thing is it will be uncorrupted by any laughter. So you'll get a nice clean take of of gasping and horror. And so they they, they I didn't remember which show was from. So they had to like plow through a lot of dress rehearsals, I guess. Mm -hmm. But a few hours later, Higgins said, oh, my God, we got it. And it is everything you said. So I, they use it. And I'm to this day, I'm pretty sure they have it like on a cart. So whenever they need the sound effect of something, not just not getting a response, but getting kind of active hate 
you know? Yeah. It was that moment. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's got some in real life, even his act, you know, he's, we do stand up on the road and, you know, you're, you're always telling rougher stuff to each other, but he was way ballsier than someone like me as far as I do stuff that kind of rubs people wrong sometimes, but his could really, like, he would <laughs> but try himself. I always himself. appreciated that. I know what you're talking about, Dave, and I know the stuff you, of yours that you're referring to, but I always yeah. loved it. Yeah, well, you I would have done it. You just didn't have the balls. I did not, but no when we would do um, when we would do the show, Dana, um, I think you'll, you'll know because you can... Mm -hmm. ask him about uh the bush stuff but when we would do any sketch i, I don't think performers in general you're saying about belushi love notes and if you think you're any good which i think we all think we're pretty good on the show at least at some level um insecure but we think we have something it's hard to take notes from people but at snl it it wasn't hard because when i got to a rewrite table and i was going to get the help of everyone you couldn't look around there and it was like the dirty dozen of great people going, I'm going to get a free joke from Conan. I'm going to get one from Downey. I'm going to get one from Schneider who does good jokes. I get uh, Jack Handy will throw one in, Smigel. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's unreal. So it, And Downey was the king of that. So if you can get Downey's attention for a few minutes at three in the morning, <laughs> then you're going to get, it's going to be better no matter what. That, your well, that goes back be to Downey it. being a head writer and having everyone wanting to get his ear to get that line or get that approval or get a different take on take what you're yeah, doing. angle and that that's exhausting right jim just well little it was on. i will say this and it's a shame that um that when i worked with you guys i didn't i mean it was all I, in retrospect not that i listen i'm for any help I may have given you guys. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm I love hearing that. And We're going to get really into how much warms you help my heart. Minute. But um, <laughs> yeah. but I um, I realized I was much happier my first four years at the show. And when I returned to the show after my second firing, I returned to the <laughs> show in um, 2000. And at that point, when I came back, I said, OK, here's the deal. I'm going to be just a regular sketch writer. I am not going to be responsible. I'm not going to be the reason someone's piece got got on or didn't get on. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be if someone comes to me as, as a friend, one to one, one on one, just do you have any thoughts on this? I'm happy to. But I'm not going to consider it my job. And I'm going to stay completely out of all office politics and <laughs> write from home, which is important. So I don't have to stay up all night. And I got to say, I was much happier during yeah. my first four years at the show and my last whatever that was 2000 to 2012 like another 12 years but that middle section where i knew both you guys i when i was head writer slash producer which was sort of like it's like being a player coach and it's kind of tough you it's know tough, yeah. uh but i mean i did and it really takes a lot of time away from from writing my own stuff which my, that my only my ego is in writing yeah. so that anything that where I felt like I, I I didn't have the space to sort of go off on my own and come up with something, um, you know, uh, so I, I but I did. I know that I I got some junk baskets, you know, as we would call them, you know, just someone was really right there with it. And I just was able to come up yeah. with the, the best well, can way I give phrasing you a it or something. Can specific yeah. example of, an, uh, of something you elevated a bit that was really very silly? It was me doing George Michael on Update, and mm -hmm. I had all the get up on, Faith. and it was all about, look at my butt, look at my butt. And it was like, my butt has magical powers, and we were doing okay. these things about magical powers. <laughs> right, and then yes. you came up with the line, if you put a wilted flower near my bottom, it blooms. <laughs> okay, that sounds... <laughs> I that wouldn't just, have, that's just a well, little bit uh, an assist that took it to another level. Oh yeah, David? <laughs> Schneider would be sleeping outside your office, at, and you crack the door to go get a cup of coffee. All right, help me with coffee machine. <laughs> and it was tough because we'd wait outside there. We'd go. We'd usually go to dinner at like that Mexican restaurant. We'd walk down, or we'd. Oh, yeah. they sent me. Oh mm -hmm. yeah, or we go to Walling Joseph's or whatever, and then we'd come back, and then everyone's stalling to write, and I'm like, oh, and then by the time I get notes that maybe this is something I shouldn't write, it was two thirty, and I'm like, wait, this is all I have, <laughs> so I'd go try to jump on something else and help out. But uh, can we uh, go ahead? Go ahead. Dana. I, I just thought we should give uh, Jim uh, one of your uh, talents is political comedy, and so 
the we had the campaign. This is in the late eighties. So we had Dukakis, the Democrat nominee for president, versus the guy I ended up doing, Bush Senior. And there was a really great line in their debate. I didn't have a good Bush at that point, but Lovitz had that line that just sure, sort of it's sure a memorable did line. Yeah, well, do you remember it? Well, no, I was going to say you say you didn't. Have, I thought your Bush was great. I mean, and it, it had, got better. It got but on the, it got wilder over time. Well, you well we should talk add, about yeah, that yeah, too, because yeah, yeah. you, me, and Al, Al, and especially you, rhythmically kept extending it. And I was doing lazy syntax, that guy over there doing that thing. And then eventually it came to, and it, and I remember specifically Jim saying this to me, oh, it's going to be Nagada. <laughs> yeah, Nagada. Na na and how was that spelled on the cue card? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's where we. G-A-D-A. Nagada. So we did we did extend the rhythms, which... uh the audience went with us, you know, but yeah. the line that I don't know who wrote that line when I as Bush was going all over the place, that guy down there doing that thing going for like a, a minute. And then Lovitz, as Dukakis says, I can't believe I'm losing to this guy. Was that, I think that, that was, sounded that was, like you, but that was maybe Franken. it was Franken. That was Franken, yeah. I'm pretty sure. But it's a great <laughs> line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, it was it was the idea was it was supposed to work both ways that it was like a commentary on Bush, but is also a commentary on Dukakis's, uh, he's just got his confidence, yeah. you know, he was unshakable. Yeah, yeah. He always acted like he, he just, you know, uh, kicked ass, you know, you know, but sometimes when I would Dukakis. do George Bush senior, I would think I was going to be in trouble after I finished. Cause I would go so out there with it. You know, I'd be like that thing guy over there moving no, in with that the Saddam Hussein one. That was you. Once you established it, it was just you. If you looked at maybe the first time you did George Bush and one of the last times you did Bush. <laughs> it got uh, very uh, out there. With the, the leap and people would go, I had no idea there, you know, how much it had evolved. But that mm -hmm. was just you having more and more fun and, and, and over time. And people who'd been watching the show certainly had no idea, you know, they, they, that you were just uh, leading them along. You Can I tell you one journey. thing that, yeah, that, that happened that would relate to this, which was, I don't know if this has happened to you, Jim, but, or David, but uh, I was doing Vegas with Lovitz and he went to a party and he ran into Gene Kelly's widow. <laughs> this like four <laughs> years ago. Wow. And well, she Gene, said, okay. Gene Kelly's widow. And she said, tell Dana, because he's telling me, John's telling me, that Gene loved his George Bush Sr. Every time he was on, Gene Kelly would say, quiet, everybody. Dana's on, you know. And so that wow. kind of blows my mind. That, that kind is, of stuff. See, and, that's, that stuff's fantastic. Right. I mean, when you get feedback back, God, I got to be honest with you, I, I, I guess I'm learning that Gene Kelly was alive into the into the uh, 90s. late 80s, early 90s. But you, yeah. I, I, I had the superstar team because you and Al are different flavors of writer. Yeah. And that having both of you <clears throat> and me in the center and the three of us really created this thing that got huge. So anyway, well, we were always, <laughs> we were always able, like the, the thing about our openings, which I don't know if your audience knows that we call them cold openings because you come right up on them without any warning. First thing. Um, yeah. And and the the ideas of the studio is usually so clogged with sets because we burn a lot of s s sketches that are dropped after dress rehearsal mm -hmm. still require sets and take take up space and everything. So the ideal cold opening has to be something really simple, uh, easy to do, and so we. That's why there's a, there in the in over the history of the show there've been a lot of. Oval Office, the, whoever is president at the time, delivering a message straight to the camera because it's something you can write on a Friday night so that it can be super topical. You don't have to the build moment. much yeah, either. Just a chair the back. And it's Brooklyn. usually at yeah. home base where they do the monologue, correct? Yep. Yep. Okay. And so it makes it, it makes it, um, and like when Dana was doing Bush, it was just something that you could, you could be, you know, I mean, we weren't, we didn't have to worry about Dana. So, so it was just like, we'd, we'd figure out whatever the idea was going to be, if we could think of one at all. And then, and, but a lot of times, a lot of times, Dana, <laughs> Throw we it did out send there. you out there <laughs> with, with not a lot in terms of the script. <laughs> and we just relied on you to, 
the red light goes on and you're going to bush it up and, you know, and we're going to have something. Well, some Sometimes I'd come in Saturday morning uh, or you, at yeah. noon and then I would hear we're doing a bush tonight. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's, <laughs> I know. sometimes it's Friday night, but sometimes it's Saturday morning. Okay. And then you and I, I guess we're. But we would, we things. would, uh, we would often have to, uh, I don't, there weren't a whole lot of them in fairness that, that you got by Wednesday or that you're, we were able to do by no, Wednesday. A lot later. of them, they tended to be a Friday night thing. I remember one that was planned was, was, this remains one of my favorite Bush pieces. It was the, um, it was the, um, if if you guys remember back, he was accused of because of the Willie Horton ads and stuff of doing a lot of negative campaigning against Dukakis. Mm -hmm. So that the joke was he had won the election. You know, he, he was president elect, but they still had plenty of money left over. So they decided to do one more negative ad. You know? <laughs> and so it was the last negative ad. It was like a kind of a. And and it was it was you sitting with your grandkids, like eating popcorn, sort of screening oh, yeah. the negative ad. Anyway, <laughs> but that, I just remember that as one that stood out because I know we had done that for read through, and I remember mm -hmm. you were like, "Really? It's at read through? <laughs> you know, it's that early? Uh, that that yeah. stunned me." Also, yeah. uh, when you when I, I left by then, so did Dana. But were you around? I think I read that you said Obama was very tough to do because no hooks, and uh, I think that is true. Dana is, sort of does one now; it's pretty good. But I think at the time, very dicey territory. Well, part of the thing I discovered with Obama. I mean, I would have said if I did say that, I'd probably change my mind pretty quickly because he definitely. I mean, I know Dana does a great Obama, and I've seen. I've seen other people do really. I mean, so he's he's not he's a lot easier to do than, say, a Biden, which I consider like really close to 10 what? out of 10. And no, it's difficulty. Not. You don't think. No. Well, Dana, oh, Dana's I, I, Dana's I, easy. Come on. I know Dana. I, I love do your it. Biden. Come on. I'm not kidding I'm around. I'm saying you Sorry, can't. I'm just saying the degree <laughs> no, it's of difficult. difficulty yes, is yes. an extreme. That's much harder than Obama. Yeah. No? Don't you agree? Yes. Obama. I only had two hooks. One was he worked his pauses so brilliantly. Yeah. We're going to do some things for the American people. Yeah. Five, four, three. To do. Because that's, that that's, that's what we, that's what we got to do. And the people go there and they got to do. And then the other one he did was politically, which was funny. And they all do it to a point. I know Biden does is talk, try to talk things into reality. You know, so during Russia's taking over Crimea, that's not, that's not that they ought not be doing that. That's not conducive. <laughs> yeah. to, you know, tanks are rolling in. That's not conducive <laughs> yeah. to international relations. That's not a good thing. Shouldn't be doing yeah. that. No. no see, so that's a great. Two, that's a great Obama. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that my only point was that Obama. I initially thought like, "Ooh, that's he's going to be tough." I guess maybe if I had expressed it better, I would have said, "There's a factor of people liked Obama." so oh, much yeah. more than they liked any of the other people we're yeah. talking about. And also Obama w is a genuinely cool guy. I mean, he, yeah, it gets in the no way doubt. of writing no about because he actually is yeah. really funny. It's hard he's to make him look like an idiot. He's not yeah, an idiot. He's, yeah. no, he's the funniest president. If you have seen him like at the White House Correspondents Dinner. Oh, yeah. Things like that. He's actually really funny. He destroyed Trump and then Trump ran because of that. Yeah. The yeah. Roasting of Trump. Yeah, yeah. But he so but the audience I've discovered doesn't really like when if they think you're making fun of Obama. Mm -hmm. They, they sort like of it. start. They start sitting back with their arms across their chest, going, you they know, tighten up a bit. Know, yeah, think again. Well, you know, like think we had again. talked about briefly, <laughs> just that idea of teaching or something that's overtly has a political point of view, and then have, doing something that has a I, using the word silly. Like I would do to to break it with the audience for me, so they'd be comfortable. I would do him doing nursery rhymes. Yes, and I would couch <laughs> it as if. No matter what Obama says, you can't not listen. Jack right. and Jill went up the hill. <laughs> Fetch a pail of water. Jack came down. Jill fell down. Well, see, that, so. that is that is a great insight because yes, an audience will it's be more perfectly, harmless. Yeah, will perfect, but it's when they feel that you're criticizing him and someone, yes. even when How even you when you're Trump? not. Right. See, Trump. I I missed the entire Trump thing because I left the show. 
uh, in the spring of 20, my, the May 2013 was my last show. Mm-hmm. And I was never Is there. there a coyote for, in your house? There's, there's that's a, a, a little, a little doggy. Oh, we'll just have to ride it out. Uh, <laughs> oh. It's, it's, it's part of the charm dog. factor. It's a charm. Um, factor. I thought he'd say something like, I'll make it stop. <laughs> that, dog, that dog's got to go. That I dog's got to go. I, I'm afraid I can't do anything about uh, the dog will stop barking in a second after the danger is passed. But <laughs> the, 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 dog, the dog didn't like my it's Obama impression. That was the problem. No, no, the dog the, is offended by my Obama. <laughs> Tulip is a fan of all Tulip. Both your work. It's not my, I didn't name the dog. It's so it's go ahead. My you weren't there during dog. Trump. You, you, you weren't there, there for. Trump. You mean for the Baldwin Trump? I wasn't there for the Baldwin Trump. I mean, they. The way they um, see Trump was the exact opposite of the way the show treated Obama. I mean, the show went the the show was absolutely everyone there was a huge Obama fan. So there was not going to be anything really critical of Obama. You could put him in certain situations where he got to be funny, sort of shitting on Republicans or else if if it was there were certain things. I wrote a a thing with Seth Meyers where um, there's Obama meeting with the premier of China and, and, the, and the, the, the Chinese premier was just busting in on you owe us money, you know, so it was the mm-hmm. translator. So, so it was it was Will Forte who was fucking brilliant in that piece. God, he's, I love Will Forte. Yeah, we and love he, him. He's he did crazy this. Funny. He did. Um, I can't think of the, the, the uh, was it the same premier? That, anyway. At the Chinese uh, premier and and uh, Nassim Hadrad was the translator. And you guys probably know that I love to write pieces where someone's <laughs> translating for someone else. It's sort of a, it's funny. been a thing yeah. of mine ever since the Spanish game show back in like uh-huh. 1978. And anyway, yeah. so it was um, Nassim Hadrad's doing the translating and and the guy would speak in China uh, and Chinese and it'd be like, when are we getting our money? <laughs> and then Obama would like... Uh, you know, and it's like, and then the premier well, would would one. speak, yeah. and she would translate like, um, mm-hmm. um, uh, 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 does does the premier look like Mrs. Obama? Does it? And, and you go what? You go. Does the premier look like Mrs. Obama? Then why are you trying to do sex to him? You know, <laughs> so it was all kind of we want our money. You know, and anyway, so that we were able to I do love that because. Guy. We weren't able it. We it didn't play as like we were critical of Obama. But yeah, the, the last piece, fine. the last political piece I ever wrote, I came back. It was an idea I had in like the summer of like it was before Trump. So it must have been like 2014. I had a, I had an idea and I called up Lauren and said, hey, can I t- turn in an, I had an idea for cold opening? And it was Ob- Obama talking about ISIS. And uh, he this is when Obama had been in all of his speeches, he kept saying, like, now, there is no connection between ISIS and the na- the religion of Islam. That's just that's not that's not a thing I would ever say. You know, it's there's no connection. And so it was the idea. The premise was Obama addressing the nation, saying that he just he'd been doing some thinking. <laughs> And he realized there's a huge connection <laughs> between ISIS <laughs> and Islam. And if you think about it, I mean, there's one on the, the side. There's the whole thing with the, you know, with with the Allah, Allahu Akbar. I hadn't <laughs> thought about that at the time, but that's that's pro. And so anyway, it played. And so I remembered it was very popular with you know Frank and other people. I showed it mm. to, and and we did it. And I remember showing it to a friend of mine. Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, who who, you know, has the Lor- oh, yeah. um, MSNBC yeah. he was a college roommate of mine. And 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 he and I showed it to him and he says, I think they're going to think you're making fun of Obama. And I said, but re- no, it's silly. It's silly. It's more. Oh, no, it's more making fun of, of sticking to that idea that like because it was kind of silly to keep insisting. Absolutely. That, oh, you know, ISIS has nothing to do, nothing at all, I yeah. tell you. And so, <laughs> and so, and, and he was right. It played to absolute silence. Wow. And, 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 and kind of surprised people at the show. Uh, Cause I gotta say, I mean, I don't know. I might not be the best judge of it, but I, I thought it was pretty funny. He had some good jokes and I don't remember those jokes, so I would share them with you, but, but it played to absolute silence. And so, 
I realized yeah. that that was that's a bit of a third rail. If you're going to do Obama, you have to. But I remember pitching. He he came to the show when he was a candidate, and um, he there was we were in a long line in the hallway because the Secret Service, you know, they wanted you know space to be able to. They sort of blocked off the hallway. We're like lined up, shaking his hand. It was like a receiving line. And I remember he's going along sort of, you know, a, a word with each guy. And then I say, like, uh, you know, I'm, I grew up in Joliet. And he like, he starts to burr, like an arrow hitting a thing and uh -huh. quivering. And he just stops dead and then gave me like three or four minutes. Right. Ooh. Because uh, and so and he was showing off his knowledge of Joliet, which is impressive, I have to say. Really? You know, so have you been, you know, I was down at six quarters on Larkin. I go, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and anyway, so upstairs <laughs> later. We were he was going to do something on the show and I'd written something for him. And and I I know this would be more effective as a story if I remembered exactly what it was. But and I watched him laugh as he read it. He was chuckling to himself and then just said, of course, you know, I can't do this. Right. <laughs> and I said, well, I was afraid you might think that. So for, for our next podcast, I will dig up that thing. Please. I know I didn't throw it away, but, you know, there was something about Ob Obama was a guy who you knew he's a, basically a funny guy. So you can at least pitch stuff to him. But like when McCain did the show, um, there My was friends. You the the Obama bit, McCain, try to get it on. McCain, <laughs> no, no. But <laughs> McCain, McCain had this thing where it, and people have sort of forgotten this aspect of his career. But he was um, like a scourge of wasteful government spending. So, David, yes. you would know this from Arizona, seeing ads sure. and stuff. He would. Really. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but he was always talking about my friends. Um, my friends. This is, why are we? What is this? Makes no sense at all. And yeah. anyway, he. Um, so I had this <laughs> thing friends. where he was just complaining about wasteful spending. And and one of the one of the jokes, almost my favorite joke in the piece was um, was. Uh, um, and what about this, my friends? A government program that warns convicted child molesters when a 10 year old boy moves into their neighborhood. What is the point? I mean, I don't understand $40 million for this program. And it's not even the money. It's not even the money. I would be against it if it were free. And, but $40 million. And so, and so My friends. Been, and he goes, and he goes, ah, oh, no, this is funny. I don't know about every joke in it. And so uh -oh. uh, like 10 minutes later, like this terrified aide comes up to me and goes, um, the p this thing about the child molester, I mean, that that's that's not in the piece, right? I mean, that that that's not going to be in the piece. <laughs> and I go, well, yeah, I mean, he didn't object. He goes, no, 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 that that's that's not no. in the piece. And then the same guy would would appear like every like half an hour <laughs> to go like that's that's still not in the piece, right? <laughs> it's right. That's that's not in the piece anyway. <laughs> well, you know, I find that. You, of course, everyone by the way, thought Trump I, I was went to fun. cards and put it in the piece. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, I didn't. You went no, rogue didn't. again. <laughs> Don't you yeah, think? Bro. I mean, maybe we should finish with this because you also uh, I, I find people laugh at Republicans more easily. Like I would do George W. Bush in Absolutely. Texas. They'd go crazy. Uh, Trump supporters, hardcore supporters laughing their ass off at Trump. But you and Will Ferrell and. Um, and Daryl Daryl Hammond, you know, hooked up for that debate stuff, and you yes, you yes. you came up, of course, famously with a word that sort of defined George W. Bush in the year two thousand. Strategic. So what? Oh Str yeah, strategy. I remember that. Yeah, of so, course. Well, that was uh, sorry. And Farrell's great I, I, anyway. That was great. I had to take it further in my stand-up act because you guys were writing so funny. I just finally went to to the nth degree with w like bod glass all americans we're gonna potec feed them here at home and on abroad <laughs> irridiculous a race credence clearwater or colored <laughs> balloons you know i just had to go insane but we'll we'll own that and he was brilliant at it and so yeah. was daryl's gore was great yeah daryl you know, daryl um you know, that great. was a case of with daryl's gore was a was a real um, you know, Daryl's very serious about his political, especially his political his impressions. And he, yeah. he, he breaks them down to like the little phonemes and little, mm -hmm. and it'll say like, I've seen this. I noticed this thing where Gore does kind of a, uh, 
thing with him, <laughs> when he sang yeah. he's a yellow scientist. or something and like these really like they're like like 10 decimal place kind of observations mm-hmm. you know and then i would come at him with a with a, a more like a wide scale kind of wide focus kind of thing like or wide angle maybe it's what i'm searching for but but like i remember i had noticed that uh the way gore had that rhythm where it go uh jim uh, in my plan, but in, but in yeah, yeah. his plan, and they had that kind of. And I remember working with him was like me working from one end of the continuum and him from the other, and meeting in the middle. And I, I was really, um, it 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 wasn't. I mean, uh, I did you know have a lot to do with his impression. I loved writing for that character, and uh, in a way. I would have probably had more fun in a way if he had been elected just because it was, Mm -hmm. I always thought Gore was inherently interesting and and weird. He was a Tennessee gentleman as well. I look at it because I would do it for my wife and I'm just doing this. And she (laughs) goes, and she thinks it's so exaggerated. It's like, well, I take umbrage con, madam. He's a Tennessee gentleman. And that that was kind of my key into it. No, no, and that that is exactly right. And but I mean, you, it should be a little exaggerated. I mean, you I, have, I a, you have so. a right to, yeah. You you yeah. identify that 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 kind of sibilant thing, sibilant, and thing. then you have every right to accentuate it. You know, yeah, take it I further. Mean, it's, this that's this fair planet game. is getting hot. I shit you not. That's my <laughs> yeah. anyway. Sorry. Okay, Jim. Sorry my last words. My last two. David things. has his final question. No, wait a I minute. The two part. Why are we wrapping this up? This is going great. It's going it great. Really it's going to be a two great. parter. She so get extra. One is. Okay. Yeah, I, I was <laughs> trying did. to look over all the great ones you you'd written or There's had a so hand many. in, but but uh, Chipmendales is one of the all time change bank Chipmendales. There's so many. That you were there, that we were there Tell for. Tell the Chippendales story, or your because that, well, that was a, you know, that's a top ten well, this, for a lot this of people. Absolutely the ties ever. into David Spade, so I, I, I hope I'm right about this, yeah, and about I, I should ask up, uh, David. My memory, okay, my memory is that you arrived for the fall of 90 spring of 91 season yes or no uh yes and no i did four shows with rob at the end of the year with dice clay candace Bergen, so 89 alec baldwin yeah then okay. i came back and we and farley and rock joined and that was our first official okay. like year so that's that's that it was what, 90 91 or something and then because because i, I, I had continue. been talking to our our friend robert smigel and he had looked it up and said like no david arrived after farley and no, I said, no, no, I, I remember him. I thought so. I, I walked had been convinced. over with him. Yeah. I had been convinced by Robert. I love Robert, but and when trickery. it comes to dates, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking <laughs> mm. about. He had been convinced that you had come after Farley. So that kind of does queer this story a little bit. But but I I you know, I I I, I know that I've, I've said this to, to Dana that I um, I one time made the mistake when I, I I didn't get my first computer until uh, this week. Well, no, 2013 (laughs) was the first time I ever used a computer. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And and I had been given an absolute state of the art MacBook Pro by Lauren as a present in 2004. And it didn't come out of the shrink wrap until for nine years. (laughs) And so (laughs) by which time it was no longer state of the art. But so the first time (laughs) I had done a different interview for a different project. It was for this this book, um, Poking a Dead Frog. It was an interviews with comedy writers. And, and, and anyway, so I was the one I wanted to see something about the book. So I Googled it and then I see my name and I sort of click on that. And my name was mentioned in a nasty review where the guy especially went after me. And so and that was the experience was so upsetting that I vowed I will never again click on anything I might see in my, and, and even someone like me, I'm not nothing like you guys, but you know, there, I have like a Wikipedia page and so I've never looked at it because oh, I saw to it. me, it's like Medusa, you know, I dare not look at it. So I occasionally will ask my son to, <laughs> um, would you check my Wikipedia page, see if there's anything I need to worry about? Mostly it's just inaccuracies, but occasionally there's been stuff that definitely is problematic, but so anyway, I extended this for the most part to anything on YouTube. Although if it's a piece that I wrote, 
I, I'm willing to look at that piece now and again, but they only recently put the Chippendales piece up on YouTube. It hadn't been up there for wow. a long time. I'm pretty sure. S and I was such looking a big at, one. I was looking at like, like Ricky Gervais or something, you know, it, it wasn't even looking at a Saturday night live thing. And then I see in the right hand column, you know, all the suggestions yeah. and there's um, Chippendales. I go, Holy shit. I haven't looked at this since, since it aired. It does probably. that on Pornhub too. So this was, yeah. this is like 20, it was from 1990. So that's going to be like 20 years at least. So I look at the piece and th these pieces never, you, I, I, that's one of the reasons I don't look at them much is because they always, they're never as good as you might remember them. Uh, and, and sometimes much worse than that. But I, but it was in this case, it was the comments and the comments were like 90, better than 90% savage. They oh, really? It. They what? hated huh? it. No, no. They fucking hated it. And all of it, was about how cruel, oh, how boy. awful, how evil, how, and you, come on, you guys have to back me up on this. Sometimes it was all we could do to get Farley to keep his clothes on. <laughs> and, uh, what do you say? At break a, that at down. A rewrite <laughs> meeting. Okay. So, so but anyway, their point was you would just run, like, run in uh, what, right? what, what goes through the mind of a writer what to think sicko. it's funny. It's, it's funny to make poor Chris Farley yeah. uh, take his clothes off for this sketch. It's just humiliating someone over something he can't help. And so, and, and the only reason I would have done the thing is because Farley was so he loved doing that for so comedy. Naked, I mean, you know, yeah, he, lo he loved getting it. anyway. So, but David, here's where you come into the story. Finally, so, and, and so I'm reading like comment after comment because I, I kept reading because I'm hoping it's going to turn around, you know, in the flow, and that someone's going to hey, let me stick up for the piece. <laughs> Didn't happen, and so and so I get to like comment 14, and then there's this guy who comes in. And it's like okay, you guys want the story? Yeah, I got the story. So. Here's the here's the story. I happen to know some people who shared it with me. David Spade was walking down the hall oh. in Saturday Night Live and he hears sobbing <laughs> coming from Chris Farley's office. Mm -hmm. So he goes in and goes, Chris, what's the matter? And Farley's at his desk just crying his eyes out. And, and David goes, Chris, is something wrong? What's happened? They go like, is and your Farley, spaghetti not here yet? <laughs> <laughs> Farley, Farley through his tears is saying through like tears. they want me to do this piece and it's so humiliating and I I just don't want to do it, but I'm terrified I'll be fired if I don't do the piece. And David says, What what piece do they tell? What is this? And they want me to be naked in this Chippendale male stripper piece. And of course, the person obviously doesn't know that you would be fully aware of the piece. <laughs> Like, this is having been a read through. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, according to the story, you read the script just oh, aghast. Yeah. And as you're going through a page, you're thinking, oh my God, oh my God. Who Every would page do such it got a thing? worse. I know. So then <laughs> you said, Chris, stay right here. You marched down to Lauren's <laughs> office and said, if you air that piece, I quit. Wow. You can have my job. It's not worth it. If you're going to do this kind wow. of thing, then my friend Chris Farley. And people are going, oh my God. That's so great. It's like Spade seems like a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> then I, and then, and then, <laughs> I walk I back and they go, uh, I go, hey, Lauren doesn't want to talk to me. So I guess you're going to have to do it. <laughs> I have no juice here. <laughs> but in, the, in the fall of 1990, that might have been the response. Uh, yeah. but, <laughs> is any of that anyway. true, David? Is any of that true? Is any of that true? Um, did, did you go to Lauren's office? No, I know that okay. uh, I know that Chris loved that sketch and I was standing very close watching it going. I didn't I, I knew it was like a 10 out of 10. I didn't know that it would have the impact for years and years of like one of the best ever. And he was so pumped. It was pretty early on where it solidified him as like such With a star. Swayze, yeah. There's no way the way he leaned into it. Threw oh, he loved into that it. Piece, that if there had been any has believe me, I never I would do a piece where I felt like I was mm. asking some person to be humiliated, but Farley just was said, yeah, fuck. Yeah, I'll do it. I'm not, oh, you know, my he God. Loved doing yeah. it. and one of the things I really think that's what sort of bonded him with the audience. That was his fourth show. That he didn't care. Oh, it was his fourth show. Care. See, I yeah, knew yeah. it. It was early. It was early yeah. on. And it was but like, anyway, Whoa. The, the reason I started yes. by asking you, David, if you remember precisely when you came was because I was talking to, to Robert Smigel, uh, this past summer, I suppose. And, and I mentioned this experience of like, man, I, I, 
I made the mistake. Maybe it wasn't a mistake, but I, I read the comments on Chippendales and whoa, boy, it was like better than nine to one against. It was like I have very few friends on that comment thread, you know, and so and he goes, well, let me check. So he I, he's tapping something out on his computer. He goes like, OK, David Spade didn't even start at the show <laughs> until like it was another three shows after Chippendales, after Swayze. Are you serious? Really? And he goes, yeah, that's so that next time you read a comment, that's. But of course, <laughs> as it turns out, Robert was wrong. Well, you know, Jim, another side story is when I went to rewrite or, you know, the Tuesday night, the host gets trotted around and we get to talk yeah, yeah, to him, yeah. all the writers. So he was in the writer's room by himself and I was coming down the hallway and it was like midnight and there was a PR person. And I said, hey, uh, hey. And I start to go and she goes, hi, uh, can I help you? And I go, oh, I just want to talk to Patrick. And she goes, and you are? <laughs> and I go, uh, David's face. She goes, and what is this regarding? And I go, I'm just a writer. I just want to. And she goes, oh, it's so he's He's so crazy right now. Wait uh, a minute. And I go. He's just reading People Magazine. I can see him. And she goes, yeah, it's, it's a little nuts right now if you can come back later. And that's how I started Receptionist. Are you telling me that was the genesis yeah. of that? Mm -hmm. And that was Swayze's shit. show, which was, I didn't write Holy it that shit. week. I, had, I wish you'd have told me that story. I had, the Receptionist, oh man, that's, David Spade's one. I know, oh, you've been yes, hogging this podcast favorite. the whole time. But well, this one. <laughs> David, you've had so many years to tell me that. I know. Okay. No, that's, isn't that funny that, that that's how that I knew for fantastic. sure I was there. Hysterical. And, uh, but far Charlie, it just to put it to bed, was loved that sketch, crushed in it, heard about it forever. Patrick Swayze was great in it. Nealon was funny. I mean, I think it was, was it Nealon and Jan Hooks? When you were, well, didn't you write when it was like Adrian, Barney? And then, uh, <laughs> yes. and then Barney yeah. keeps making faces at, and it's like, Barney, Barney, it's over. It's over. Okay. Yeah. Like he's still trying like, to no, win. Barney, Barney, our decision's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, but no, the, the, um, by the way, let me just say, not only was it, did, was the, in, the, impetus or the impulse to do that piece it was because patrick swayze was the host Rick and you look Fitt. at swayze and you go Come and he's on, a dancer Chippendales, and it's Chippendales a dancer right it's a perfect so, written thing for a host too yeah the idea that was he that, loved that, it. That, that i was sitting there going like how can i exploit farley's <laughs> overweightness and, and oh, how can i get that on the air how can no, we put a was, sketch around it a yeah, humiliation exactly. start with humiliation so, no for, i think i did one that there, was worse with Chris. What was that? But it, 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 it never blew up like this one because Chris was game for anything. Was it the David spaceship? David knows him better than anybody. But I, I don't remember the exact, oh, but I remember I was Ross Perot. Chris was in it. Maybe Franken wrote it, but by the end, I'm mm. riding Chris. He's kind of, and he's, and I'm going, I'm, I'm going to ride you, piggy boy. Come on now, oh, piggy boy. boy. Here's it, you know. So oh, that why? one... You Chris should be was canceled. La I was even asking Chris, is this okay? And he was just laughing his ass he, off. He doesn't care about anything. All right, uh, Jim, before we go, and I, get, I know you got a million things to do, but this last <laughs> thing is from me and Dana. We both know that for the people that don't realize uh, how much you've done on the show, um, Dennis Miller actually said you were the second most important person in the history of SNL behind Lauren. And I thought that was great until he said I was God a third. Him. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> he's God the second him. most no, is important that guy in the building. Downey. Okay. Yeah, it is true. You, you were uh, no. such a big part of that in Letterman. But this thing that lives on for you, lucky for you, you're in memes on Instagram all the time, is Billy Madison. Uh, you gave the greatest yeah. speech. And I think, did you help write all of Billy Madison? Or did you throw in jokes or did you just get I that part? Only, only that part. Only that part. And I was up in um, Toronto, um, not not very effectually, but but I was asked to to you know work on on Tommy Boy, and I was up there with Fred Wolf, and and um, um, I'm pretty sure that's when this was. Unless I'm yeah, confused. they shot the same summer. Okay, and so and so uh, uh, Adam uh, uh, asked me if if I would do this thing, and it's funny that we're talking about the genesis of things. Well, the the thing about Farley, if you guys remember, that's what I always used to say to Farley when he would speak at a writer's <laughs> meeting. I would go, you would go like, what about, I would go like, uh, thanks, Chris. Everyone's now dumber. Are you proud of yourself? <laughs> and he I would hope love you're that. happy. Are you proud and of I, I, So I, I channeled that when I was, uh, I was rewriting that, that part. And I, I made sure. So that was whenever I hear that thing comes back and it, it is a popular 
of, of all the things I've ever done in my life, probably that is the one that I that comes back at me the most. Our producer, Greg Holdsman, says it's an important part of his childhood. So what what is it? So just set the scene real quickly and then what your line that is now remembered. It was kind of long, though, right? It wasn't just that. Well, well it's it funny. was the I, punch, punch I, line. I, I tell you, the funniest, the funniest time it ever came back at me, I was at my college 25th reunion and I was doing a little presentation where I showed clips from the shows and both of you guys are represented. You'll be oh. glad to know. And um, so it was my Harvard 25th reunion and I'm standing there and uh, I was, there's a sort of a, a like a, it's, it wasn't exactly backstage. It was actually outside, but it was kind of like a courtyard and I were going to, I was going to be introduced and come out and I was sort of pacing, like going over what I was going to say. And I look over and about as beautiful a girl as I've ever seen in my life. And David, if you'd seen this girl, you would have been <laughs> all over that. But she was this tall, beautiful, blonde girl. Brings me into and she, it. She, she, well, I mean, <laughs> so well, David, you know, over. he's a man about town. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but Dana, Dana was our, he was our player and remains our player. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so this girl comes <laughs> over to me and it's like, she actually sort of like sauntered sexily over to me. And it was like, like a James Bond movie scene. Or something. And she, she grabs my ear and whispers sexily into my ear uh, the entire speech from Billy Madison. <laughs> and, but she had it word perfect. And I, I didn't, I didn't remember it myself. This was 1999. So it was like, you know, five or six years after the movie came out, I didn't even remember it myself, except the parts about uh, everyone. It was like at no point, <laughs> what in your rambling, incoherent? Did you were you even close to anything that could um, that resembled a? And I don't even remember seeing <laughs> something. Point. I award you no points. And everyone in this room is now dumber for having heard it. I award you no points. <laughs> and, and may God have mercy on your soul. Yeah. And and that's it. <laughs> that she does the whole thing perfectly. And then her father, who was my classmate steps out from a pole. Ah, we got you. This is my daughter, my daughter, Claire. Oh. And I, it's just such a, such a bizarre experience to this day. Um, yeah, that's, that was such so a weird. I've seen the movie that are listening. Adam Sandler's character gives a speech in the gym and it's horrible. <laughs> and then Jim <laughs> critiques it and it gets the last line is may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> just for giving an uh, uncoordinated yeah. speech, basically. Wow. <laughs> and, and, then, and, then, is a classic. and then, um, uh, Steve Buscemi is up in the stands with a high powered rifle and <laughs> he shoots Brad Bradley Whitford. Oh, who's the yeah, bad the, guy, the, the bad guy. And uh, that was no, that was a lot of a lot of great people in that uh, in that movie. Norm was uh, in a reaction shot. Norm, I watched it last Norm, night. Yeah. Yep. And uh, uh, that's right. We got that was a fun uh, hang that that uh, uh, that summer. Yeah, it was called Billy Madison, and we were called Billy the Third. Do you remember that? And, uh, and the, t the Turners named the movie Billy the Third a midwestern uh, Tommy Boy. That was what it was was called. And then when Billy Madison was shooting, we were shooting. We're like, oh shit, he's going to come out first. We can't use Billy twice to SNL. You know, all on SNL. I did not. I did never realize. I thought when you said Billy the Third, I thought you were saying like it was my third priority that summer. <laughs> no, it was. Oh, no. Bill, and they were and they were uh, shooting, and we were shooting, and then I was like, fuck. So we couldn't come up with Tommy Boy for a while because Billy the Third was. It was Billy, and then it turned into Tommy, and then I think Brian Denny just called him Tommy Boy, and and then I didn't even like Tommy Boy at the beginning. I go, ah, I don't know about that one, but now he's kind of stuck, and now I like it. But that was why, because Billy was taken. We both wrote a movie with Billy in the same summer. We shot. I remember. I remember. I got roped into that because I I had Lauren had wanted me very badly to to work on the script, and I, I you know I. I I think a couple of my ideas re remain, but it was really Fred. And, and um, I thought actually the funniest things in the movie were, were you and Fred. And, and um, uh, but anyway, there was a, a, an arbitration with the Writers Guild because oh, yeah. I think, I think uh, whether or not the question is whether or not to share for Fred to get part screen credit. Yeah. I, I said, I don't deserve it and I don't need it and don't worry about me. But I remember that it was, it was the first time I was ever, involved in in the craziness of that the committee you know they yeah, they, they award huge points to the names of the characters 
And I go, who the fuck cares what oh, a character's wow. name is? Unless it's like, well, no, but who had the idea to call the guy, you know, uh, Brad Hartman? And I go, well, okay, <laughs> that, that wasn't me. Oh, really? Oh, that's because the- with you, he was Andy Barnett. Jim, I remember oh, okay. one scene you wrote in Tommy Boy that stuck with everyone. It was where Farley took off his shirt and said, look how fat I am. <laughs> okay. That one I was trying. I was mad at him. You were always fat you guys him. would do it. it. I don't know if it made the final <laughs> cut, but I go, this is Jim's. You have to do it. Um, <laughs> and none of us. Didn't you threaten to quit? And, and the we all laughed at him. No, and no. then I was the one that cried and said, why is Farley on so much? <laughs> 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 oh, it's because the, the, the Q ratings just came in. Um <laughs> Uh, and anyway. David, everyone knows you did all you could to keep that out. So, <laughs> well, Jim, thank you. I guess we'll we'll go. But you're a well, fucking stud. You we love you. Uh, everyone talks you highly Jim of you. Jim Downey, the one and only. Let's, let's not let this be the only time we get together. You know. Uh no, we'll David, be doing now this that, for now, David. I got your phone number. <laughs> I know. I tricked them into giving it to me. I, love and I know it's yours because of the outgoing message. So oh, I'm, yeah, not gonna, I'm not going to say it. Don't you worry about it. that. It's funny. <laughs> you know, but I, I was not able. It took me a long ass time to you know. Yesterday was rocks was rocks birthday. Did you call him? And well, I tried to because I don't have an up to date number for him. So so I, I um, Marcy Klein, who I was texting with, text me like, um, hey, um, you know, it's Chris Rock's birthday. And it's funny because I just had dinner Sunday night with Tim Meadows. And Tim oh. told me, well, my birthday was yesterday oh, and shit. Rocks is coming up. So I, I was aware. And I know Marcy Klein talks to Chris all the time. And so and so I, Marcy had sent me a text about something else. I go, hey. Um, and she goes, and, you know, it's Chris Rock's birthday. And I go, hey, well, send me send me his number. Uh-oh. I'll text him. Happy birthday. And then there's like nothing. There's no what? response. I'll and then, then I get a text uh-huh. like, I'll hook you up. I'll what hook you up mean? with him. Meaning I, she doesn't want me to have this, this she doesn't want to give me his phone he number. loves you so Good i just Lordy. i just texted her back saying you know maybe after i've been at the show a few more years you know by the way jim this is me. like it's back then it's me and you and dana talking <laughs> like we're wall and joseph yeah. i saw rock the other night meadows and marcy klein this is like we're all talking still from uh, uh, wow. long ago you know yeah. we um we, we didn't want bond. we didn't we want to bond. make you nervous jim but the actual working title for this podcast is the hot seat but we uh, didn't want to let you know. We didn't that have enough gotcha moments. I'm glad, I'm glad you. I did not know that because I would have <laughs> I, been a I fucking nervous wreck. No, Jim, you're <laughs> great. I did not know that. Anything you say that. is interesting about old SNL, and everyone loves to hear it. Um, but uh, we'll yeah. talk soon, Enjoyable, and thank you for coming. Really. Oh, All we're right, gonna Jim, be we'll talk soon. We're going to be oh, talking. All right. Guys. I will be call on the you phone. That's what we're doing. Okay, bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you, Jim. Bye, bye. Hey, what's up, flies? What's up, fleas? What's up, people that listen? We want to hear from you and your dumb questions. Questions, ask us anything. Anything you want. You can email us at flyonthewall at cadence13.com. Hey, Alex. Alex May. Alex wants to know what your experience was like living in New York City back in the SNL days. Figured you were at 30 Rock all the time, but curious what New York stories you've got and whether you liked it or not. He loves our show. That's like a 45-minute answer. I know. That is a small book. It's yeah. like a 100-pager. When I got out there, I was uh, my brother, Annie, and Katie. They, they lived up in the Upper West Side, so I moved up there. And mm-hmm. I didn't really know anyone. And a lot of people live in the Upper West Side. Dana Carvey, Dennis Miller, Mike Myers. And where were you? I was like 84th and mm-hmm. West End. And mm-hmm. so I had a dinky little dump and... It was tough living up there. I'm from Arizona, so the living in through the winters and not... My hair got brown within minutes. What happened is my hair was always <laughs> white because I was in the sun, always in Arizona. And then in New York, it's only sunny for about 10 minutes a day because the sun goes between the buildings and it comes oh, straight yeah. down no, on no, you. And, the and it's shadowy. Yeah. It's freezing. So hair got dark, didn't eat well, and l- loved New York, but the experience was really just being in the building. We didn't do anything other than that. Well... First of all, I was there before I did SNL. I, I worked in Rockefeller Center in 1981 with Mickey Rooney and Nathan Lane. And I got an apartment on Lexington Avenue. And they told me that Robert Redford edited Ordinary People in the apartment. And I said, yeah, right. 
Six years later, I'm doing a movie with Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas. The director says, oh, I was an editor. I, I edited Ordinary People with Robert Redford. Where'd you edit it at? And that was the apartment. We can cut that wow. one. Here's one thing for a California. Oh, I like that. That's Here, a real answer. I, these are long stories. But um, the you'd go to a movie, and it's like, 65 you'd come out of the movie and it's 25 i'd never experienced Degrees, that. yeah yeah getting cabs like i didn't have a car service anytime so just getting to snl on saturday yeah if that's it was snowing very weird. trying to get cabs was really difficult i would say experientially rockefeller center is just uh the coolest the weirdest kind of almost haunting building all the history of it and uh there's nothing like being in New York City doing well on Saturday Night Live. That's the most intense thing you could have. And, you know, I don't know if I'm the first one to think of this, but if you can make it there, um, you can make it anywhere. In where? New York? Yeah. New yeah. York. New York. I mean, it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these old vagabond shoes, you know, I had. Should um, I start spreading that news? You know, <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Um New York, New York. Just let me tell you. Thank you, Alex. That was a great question. Thank you. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. Production and engineering led by Greg Holtzman, Richard Cook, Serena Regan, and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 